We're going to let some people filter in for this event. I'm going to wait a little bit. And All right. Welcome to PMP Live. I'm Alan Watke, Deputy, Deputy Director of Events at Politics and Prose. I want to thank you all for joining us today, uh, celebrating Walter Pincus and his new book, Blown to Hell. At any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat that I'll throw in there, and you can purchase a copy of Blown to Hell on the Politics and Prose website. You'll be able to ask Walter a question by clicking on the Q&A link, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to the audience questions towards the end of the reading, and we'll try to get to all of your questions, but apologize if we do run out of time. For this event, closed captions is available. Uh, there's a link right next to the Q&A box, a CC link. You can click on that to enable the closed, ca closed captions. Finally, we wanna thank you all for being here with us today. We're so thankful to our family of loyal customers keeping PMP afloat. And now I'd like to welcome to PMP Live, Walter Pincus, celebrating his book, Blown to Hell, The Dark History of America's Deadliest Nuclear Test. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Walter Pincus exposes the darkest secret in American nuclear history, 67, nuclear tests in the South Pacific's Marshall Islands that decimated a people and their land. Walter reported on intelligence, defense, and foreign policy at the Washington Post from 1966 to 2015. He's among the Post reporters awarded the 2002 Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. Among many other honors were the 1977 Pol George Polk Award for articles exposing the neutron warhead a 1981 Emmy for writing a CBS documentary on strategic nuclear weapons, and the 2010 Arthur Ross Award from the American Academy for Diplomacy for columns on foreign policy. Currently a contributing senior national security columnist for the Cypher Brief, he lives right here in DC. Walter will be joined in conversation tonight with David Ignatius, a prize winning columnist for the Washington Post and has been covering the Middle East and the CIA for four decades. He has written several New York Times bestsellers, and most recently, The Paladin, a spy novel, which we hosted here on, on PMP Live as well. And he also lives here in DC. And so now, without further ado, please welcome to PMP Live, Walter Pincus and David Ignatius. Hello, fellows. Welcome. So it's a great uh, pleasure to have a chance to talk to Walter about uh, his his book. Um, for younger viewers tuning in who, who don't uh, know Walter's work, um, he is a legendary Washington Post uh, uh, journalist and is known for digging into original source materials, finding things that other people overlooked, um, and uh, untangling the most complicated subjects. He now writes a column for the Cypher Brief that's called Fine Print. And that kind of uh, explains Walter's approach. Walter reads the things that other people overlook and, and finds the truth that's there. And that's really the case with his, his book. Uh, Walter, before we start. Oh, David, you muted. You muted yourself. I want to read just a couple of sentences from the epilogue of Walter's book um, because they moved me a lot when I read them, and it's a good way to get into this. Walter writes, people today have forgotten if they ever knew what a single nuclear weapon can do. This has been an obsession of mine, Walter's, for 50, 
plus years that I've been writing about national security affairs. So Walter, let's let's do start there. I want to ask you to to tell our audience a little bit about how you came to write this book, uh, or how this subject uh, became focused in your mind, as you'll explain, a long time ago. Uh, to be honest, David, it started back in 1966 when I was covering Congress. And Congress passed a bill to give 82 people, Marshallese from an atoll, a tiny atoll called Rondelap, who had been dosed with radioactive fallout in 1954, 14 years earlier. What had happened was that uh, we blew off the biggest thermonuclear bomb we ever did. It was supposed to be five megatons. Megaton is a million tons of TNT. And we never had experience with fallout, which is the bomb picked up a whole coral island along with water and blew it 120 miles away. So that it came down for five hours on men, women, and children on Rongola. And they suffered burns. Uh, they were moved off the island two days later. But meanwhile, they drank the water that had radioactivity in it, ate the food that had radioactive fallout on it. Uh, this had never really happened to anybody. And, and what I tell people, which they don't understand, is that Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the two bombs, were detonated 1,500 and 2,000 feet above ground. So there was not this kind of fallout because the scientists that built the first atomic bomb didn't know what would happen if the, the fireball, the exact explosion hit the ground. So by design, they, it didn't. There was no fallout. You could move back into Hiroshima if you were not wounded. Many people, a huge number of people were killed. But the fact is, you could move back in within days the cities are rebuilt. The lesson between Rongelap and Hiroshima is if nuclear weapons were ever used again, they'd be aimed at targets on the ground and below ground. You would have fallout. It would not be Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It would be more like Chernobyl. Nobody would live where a bomb went off for 40 years. And that's why I, I, I wrote this. The poor people at Rongola, Congress suddenly got feeling guilty and they decided to give them payment for having what they had suffered. And they decided on giving them close to a million dollars for 82 people. It ended up, they gave them $11,000 each to a society that didn't have a money exchange. They didn't live with money. So they had to have money explained to them. And they had to sign a paper saying they would never ask for any more from the United States. Well, that didn't happen. But they began to get sick nine years after the bomb. And in fact, every year, a doctor went out with a crew of doctors to examine them. And the 82 people became a kind of living laboratory for the effects of low level radiation. Uh, people who were anti-nuclear made use of the Marshallese convinced them they were being used as guinea pigs. 
And uh, an American doctor who ran those examinations for years was caught in the middle of both trying to take care of the medical problems that the Rangala people were facing, but also participating in the study of what low-level radiation did to people. So it has a human story to it, and it has a lesson for all of us when it comes to nuclear weapons. This is a, a good time to remind the viewers that if you want to purchase this book, uh, and it is a very disturbing story, as, as Walter just explained, go to the chat function at the bottom of your screen and pull it up. And there's a link that will allow you to go directly to a site uh, and order, order the book from Politics and Prose, not from Amazon.com, but from our, our great local bookstore. Thank you, Politics and Prose. So Walter, one of the things that I felt reading your book was um, a, a reminder of what the Cold War was like, that obsession with our adversary. Um, maybe you could tell us the story that's at the beginning of the book about how within a year after the Second World War had ended, we were uh, on Bikini Atoll in the, in, the, in the Marshall Islands testing additional weapons. We, 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 we were, the war wasn't over, our war was gonna continue. We were gonna keep testing these things. Why were people so determined in those days uh, to have uh, ever greater mastery of, of nuclear weapons? Well, the fact that two bombs, which were really designed as terror weapons, they were not designed to fight and win wars. They were so devastating. Two bombs ended a war, and uh, we decided, as did the Russians, and every major country, really, that nuclear weapons would be the future of warfare, as devastating as they were. And so we quickly, we only had six or seven that we had left after uh, Japan surrendered. And we wanted more. And we wanted to make them bigger, probably safer, we didn't know much about them and knew even little about their effect uh, for warfare. But there was a, uh, as there is always, a, a, uh, the army and the Navy were sort of fighting each other as to who's gonna be dominant. And the Army Air Force, we didn't even have an Air Force at the time. The Army Air Force, was in a prime position because they had this nuclear weapon. So the Navy wanted to test out what its future was gonna be. And so they had these tests in Bikini where they brought in 60 some odd older ships, some captured German ships, uh, Japanese ships, used them as targets and planned to have three tests uh, one of a drop nuclear atomic bomb, the other of a underwater, and then a third deep underwater to see where the Navy would fit in. And um, what they did, it, the first test was dropped and missed the target. Uh, the hundred or so newsmen were 30 miles away and it undercut the fear of nuclear weapons because it didn't look very much to them and it didn't seem like it was that much destruction. The second test was uh, 90 feet underwater and it uh, threw up a huge amount of water covered almost the entire area of targeted ships 
And what they found was they couldn't go in and see what happened quickly as they had the earlier one because the ships were all covered with radioactive water and sand. And so the press, which didn't want to stay around, left. And uh, it turned out, had they stayed, they would have been able to talk about the real danger of fallout. But the fact is, they left. It took four or five days before you could even go back on the ships because they were so hot with radioactivity. And then they spent days trying to wash it down to get rid of the radioactivity. The long and short of it is they never did. They couldn't get it off the ropes. They couldn't get it off the canvas. They couldn't get it off the wood railing. Uh, and uh, eventually they had to sink all the target ships. And they didn't know any of that before they tested. So Walter, one of the things uh, that uh, runs through the book, especially in that uh, initial set of uh, tests uh, in 46, is the question of whether the press was doing its job. And that's something that you have thought about um, deeply for many decades. Uh, you're one of the people who was prescient about the Iraq war, wrote clearly and forcefully about it when uh, many journalists didn't. I, I wanna just ask you to talk a bit about the, the, the press of the late 1940s as the Cold War was heating up. Uh, examples of, of journalists not doing their job. And then if, if there are examples you would cite of journalists who were breaking through that um, to really get at the truth, uh, I, I know people would be interested in that as well. It, I mean, back in this early period, if you just focus on, on the nuclear part of it, um, the scientists were learning. We really didn't know, they didn't know what they were building. And they didn't know uh, each of the services. The, uh, by 47, we had the Air Force. The Army, Navy, and Air Force were competing. And they were asking the scientists to build weapons for each one of them. As if, I mean, we in the 50s, for example, we're building uh, underwater nuclear torpedoes. Putin, the other about eight, six or eight months ago, announced there's a new, he, they're building a nuclear torpedo. We built one. They built nuclear anti aircraft material <laughs> because they were thinking of World War II and massive bombers coming over. And so they needed it. Uh, the Army wanted an atomic tip Hercules missile. We stationed them all over the country. Uh, my favorite used to be the uh, engineers wanted a nuclear uh, bomb to bury. And in fact, uh, Paul Nitze at one point when he was in defense war, had a plan to line across north to south in Europe, a series of uh, nuclear atomic demolitions, uh, munitions, so that he would blow them all up at once and have a radioactive gulf to stop the Russians from coming across Europe. I mean, it was wild. It was, and, and I got fascinated with nuclear artillery that went eight miles with a 10 kiloton explosive, which depending on which way the wind was blowing, if it hit the ground, it would hurt the people who fired it probably as much as where it landed. Uh, they, we sent, if you can believe it, 
2,000 eight-inch artillery shells to Europe during the Eisenhower administration. And the German government made us station them eight miles from the border because they didn't want them used in Germany. But of course, you couldn't use them against uh, the uh, Warsaw Pact countries because uh, they wouldn't have invaded. You'd have to fire before an invasion started. And, and when I was working for Senator Fulbright during my brief time running investigations for him, I found out that uh, the artillery crews that had the eight inch nuclear weapons had a whole platoon whose whole job would be to pick the weapons up and run if it ever looked like there was an invasion coming because they had no authority to fire them before the war started. But the nuclear weapons at a tactical level have always been crazy. So uh, let me just take this uh, opportunity to ask uh, our viewers to, to do two things. Uh, one, if you have questions for Walter, uh, please uh, uh, put them in the uh, chat uh, uh, function and we'll get to them uh, towards the end of our show. And then secondly, if you go in the chat function, you can buy Walter's book uh, and read the story of what happened to these uh, Marshall Islanders uh, in uh, a part of the Cold War story that I'll bet uh, almost none of our viewers really know much about. Um, so Walter, uh, let me ask you to move the story forward to 1954, uh, when we're now testing um, H-bombs, much more destructive nuclear weapons. And there's a decision to go to Rangalop, which you mentioned at the outset. Tell us about, about those tests, uh, the uh, extent to which there were any efforts made to protect the, the people who were living there. Uh, and then to tell us uh, the, about the consequences for the people in, in terms of the long-term health effects, first the, the evacuation, disruption of their lives, but then the longer-term health effects. Well, they, as we moved to hydrogen bombs, uh, we had tested smaller weapons in the States, but they realized there was a problem with fallout in, in the US. And so they moved the bigger ones out. And uh, the Bravo test in March 1st, 1954, was the first deliverable hydrogen bomb. And to show how little we understood what we were doing, uh, the bomb was set, expected to go off at five megaton. You've got to remember that, I'll tell you, that in the bikini tests in 46, we moved the people of Rongelap off when we were testing bombs at 23 kilotons. This bomb was a thousand times more powerful. And we didn't move them off, uh, although people wanted to originally, uh, because the Eisenhower administration wanted to save money and didn't have any feeling about fallout and certainly fall out traveling 120 miles away. The bomb went off. That's exactly what happened because the winds at that high level went into the atmosphere and partly into space. And the winds at those levels travel at different directions at different speeds. And so it took two days before we found out that there was fallout on Rongelap 120 miles away. And it was only really confirmed because there, we had a weather station just beyond it uh, where they had uh, devices that could count fallout, count radioactivity 
and they went off the charts. And so on the second day, uh, they went and picked up first the people in Rongelap, and then they actually picked up people at a, another atoll called Uteric, 300 miles away, where they also were showing light, lighter amounts of fallout, but they had fallout. And, and we evacuated them and brought them to another to an atoll called Kwajalein, where we had a Navy base and isolated them. They were beginning to show burns. They were showing uh, trouble with their blood counts. Uh, but we initially denied anything really happened to them. And it wasn't until two weeks later that a Japanese fishing boat that had been uh, outside the danger area, but inside the area of fallout, some over between 90 and 100 miles in a different direction from Mongolia, uh, also had fallout on it. And they also showed radioactive poisoning. And when they arrived in Japan, it became the first public knowledge that there had been fallout from this bomb. And, and initially we tried to downplay that. So Walter, the story of this Japanese fishing boat, the Lucky Dragon uh, is one of the really upsetting parts of, of your book this fishing boat just wanders into an area where it has no idea that there's danger. Uh, there's no attempt to warn it, to warn the crew. And then um, you tell a wonderful story about good journalism uh, in Japan from a Japanese paper called the Yomiuri Shimbun. And maybe you could share with our viewers the story of how that paper came to break this news. And then, as you say, the efforts by the United States to discredit it. Well, a young Japanese stringer, uh, somebody who was working for the paper, but on a, on a per article basis, was lucky enough to be living in a house where a, um, woman had talked to some of the seamen who were affected and learned that two of the, the Japanese seamen had already been sent uh, to Tokyo to a hospital because uh, some Japanese doctors who studied radiation because of the atomic bomb uh, were interested in what happened. And he, who was covering a crime story, was at dinner and heard this story and suddenly uh, went out in the late evening and found some of the seamen and wrote a, an article. It was sent to Tokyo. Uh, the Tokyo people were alert to it. And, and sent a reporter to the hospital where they had sent the seaman to try to, and the hospital tried to hide him. Uh, and they held, uh, they finally got the story of what happened, that the boat had arrived and these people were suffering from radiation, from American tests. Nobody had known about it in the world. And, uh, they held a story, as those of us who were in morning papers know, at the till the last minute, so no other morning paper could get it, and printed it. And it was the first word around the world that this had happened, even in Washington. And it's an amazing <laughs> news story. It's it's a wonderful story. Um, uh, our former boss, Don Graham, would want us to mention that the Yomi, Yomiuri Shimbun, the newspaper that uh, 
courageously broke this story was for many decades a partner of the Washington Post. And uh, so we always had a special fondness for them. Uh, Walter, reading your book, um, I found myself asking a question that you often uh, ponder when you're thinking about the stories of the harm that the United States has done uh, in the world during the Cold War, uh, certainly in the, our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. About about this, what was going through the minds of the people um, in our government who made decisions, and I'm curious what your judgment is. Whether they were simply uh, inattentive, they didn't know what the dangers of fallout would be. They overlooked the possibility of of, uh, of civilian harm, or whether there was something more malign, a, a kind of willful ignorance, if you will. What, what's your what's your feeling about about the Americans in this story who are the architects of the suffering uh, of the uh, people of the Marshall Islands? It's it's these stories are always mixed. There are people trying to do the right thing, and people who want to do what they think is best for the country, and there are a few who do what's best for them. Uh, I've always felt the weapon itself is a terrible weapon. But the fact of the matter is, it is for the first time kept major powers that have the weapon from fighting each other. So in a funny way, we ended the Cold War with no really direct confrontation. And it does deter. It, it, and it, in my view, and it's certainly not most people's view, uh, they'll never be used again because the people closest to them know how devastating they are. They've become to me more diplomatic weapons and domestic political weapons, used at home to show how strong you are, used abroad to show you're a, a real power, uh, in some cases used to, to keep your government safe from other governments. But um, as far as dealing with the Marshallese, uh, the most complex relationship was between a doctor named Robert Kennard, who led the annual examinations of the Rongelap people, because uh, I went out there in 1974 with Dr. Kennard and a group of doctors and watched them examine not just the, the exposed Rongelap people, but also the non-exposed. On the one hand, they solved a lot of normal uh, medical issues for those people. On the other hand, they were unknowing to the Rongola people using them effects of, of uh, radiation. And beginning nine years after the exposure, uh, children, everybody under 20, began to show nodules in their thyroids. And uh, they were brought to the United States, their operations, their thyroids were removed and it replaced, to replace the thyroid, which governs how your enzymes work, uh, they had to take pills. And some of them did, some of them didn't. But if you hadn't removed them, they would have become cancerous. Um, so we, we took care of them on the one hand. On the other hand, we used them. And uh, Dr. Kennard was just torn between those two uh, uses because 
anti-nuclear people got hold of Marshallese and used them by telling them they were being guinea pigs for the US. And uh, for a period of time, uh, they refused to be examined. And, and that gap of a year, ironically, ended up uh, sort of leading the way to the death of the youngest child of the Rangalap governor. His whole family was affected medically. But Lacoge Angine, who was one, who played in the fallout as if it was snow coming down, because it came down white, um, ended up dying of a kind of leukemia you only get from radiation when he was 19 years old. Walter. Um... Nuclear weapons and their effects uh, in some ways have been uh, the work of your career. I, I think uh, when you and I were colleagues at the Washington Post of how many stories you broke um, in, in that area. And as you say, uh, I think there really is a, an understanding uh, among Americans who thought deeply about nuclear weapons. And I think this is probably true of, about Russians as well that these are, are weapons that, that are unusable. That, that people who've, who've thought deeply, George Schultz uh, is an example of somebody at the end of his life, uh, George Schultz was certainly a tough guy, but he, he came to the view that um, nuclear weapons should be uh, dismantled, removed from our arsenal. But I wanna ask you whether uh, you think that people from other countries, not the US and, and Russia, uh, but, but uh, countries like Iran, North Korea, that aspire to have nuclear weapons, have a, the same understanding that they're unusable. My fear is that there is a generation of aspiring countries that may not have the same constraints. What do you think? I hate to say that uh, when I first started writing about it, particularly in the Reagan administration, in the Reagan administration, uh, there were people who thought you could fight and win a nuclear war. Uh, but they were strategists. They were people in colleges and think tanks. You talk to the military, and they know that when the first one is used, Nobody knows what's going to happen next. When you talk about, we used to talk, however, uh, the Reagan people used to talk about the Russians being perfectly willing to use nuclear weapons, that they had a wonderful civil defense system in their subways, et cetera, et cetera. And I can tell you, if you want to stay down your subway for 20 years, yes. But the logic is no. And, and it's a lesson that is, still needs to be learned. I mean, I just wrote a piece uh, a month ago. If you read Colin Powell's uh, interviews in the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, he was dead set against nuclear weapons. He didn't want the army to have them because he felt they were useless. Um, I think, uh, having been to Iran during the hostage crisis and talked to people, we may say they're crazy, but they're not. And the same, I, I'm nervous about the same things being said about the Chinese now because they're building up their nuclear stockpile because we have three times as many weapons as they do, uh, or even hope to get. And it, it, we make that dangerous as if, because there are so many Chinese, they're willing to use them. Uh, it, it is a 
a nasty verbal game, but it's usually played by people who don't really understand uh, the danger of using one of them. I still remember talking to Bob McNamara about the Cuban Missile Crisis when he told me he, the first time he and President Kennedy talked about the possibility of a nuclear weapon being used. And, and McNamara said, uh, having studied that one nuclear weapon uh, would start a, uh, an exchange that would end most countries, or both the US and Russia, and probably the world given the fallout. So that's a, a powerful, uh description of, of what I, I think that our wisest uh, statesmen everywhere have come to. And uh, it, it is true that nu nuclear weapons capability in India and Pakistan, which some people feared might lead to their use uh, because those two countries are in a state of constant tension, there, there has been a, a, a balance that they haven't been used. So maybe that is encouraging. I want to uh, suggest to people uh, one more time before we go to your questions that if you want to uh, buy Walter's book, uh, go to the chat box at the bottom of your screen, and there is a little icon that you can click on, and Politics and Pros will be happy to sell you a book and send it to you. And having just finished the book, I really encourage people to, to do that. So um, I'm going to go to questions, uh, Walter, from our audience. The first is from somebody who identifies themselves as anonymous attendee. Fair enough. This book seems to be a riveting combination of journalism and history. What are your hopes for this book, i.e., what impact are you hoping your reporting will have beyond correcting the historical record? Good question. It's, to me, the purpose was uh, to make people understand how dangerous they are and to hope that they never get used again. I'd never, I think, I, I'd never been with uh, Global Zero or groups that, that want to do away with nuclear weapons. You're never going to do away with it. Um, you have to look at them as unused diplomatic and political weapons, and you have to keep reminding people how terrible it would be if one of them was used. <laughs> Do you, do you think, Walter, that we are not paying enough attention to this subject? I, listening to you talk about this, I, I'm realizing how few articles there are these days about nuclear weapons other than about uh, Iran or North Korea, uh, which are big political issues. But have we stopped paying enough attention to the possibility that these weapons could destroy our planet? I think. I mean, my purpose was to show how long lasting any result damage would be if they were ever used to remind people to keep in front of them. Not, nuclear weapons have become a number. I, I taught a course um, to recently at Stanford and, and realize Stanford, which probably has one of the best groups studying nuclear weapons, the students had no idea of what a weapon could do. It's all been numbers. Um, you know, we have a thousand, they have 1500, we've got to build it. Uh, the Chinese are building a, a hypersonic weapon uh, with a nuclear warhead. We've got to build one. No, we don't. Um, but it's been that arms race number game rather than what the hell one of these could do. And, and the idea is you would use 
you need a thousand. Uh, we at one point had 40, 40 nuclear weapons aimed at Kiev. It's what got Richard Cheney, of all people, to realize we're overdoing it. And we actually cut back in, in H.W. Bush, period. There was more nuclear uh, reduction in the period when Cheney was defense secretary in any other period in the world. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, it, people thought of nuclear weapons as numbers, rather than thinking of, of, of terror weapons, uh, you know, one of which can destroy a city, and did. And the weapon that destroyed Hiroshima was 12 and a half kilotons, which is now roughly what we consider uh, a low yield weapon. Walter's book, uh, when you read it, you'll see has um, incredible descriptions of what it's like when the fallout, those particles, specks of, of white uh, come down and, and, you know, get into your scalp and get into your body. Um, it's, it's very powerful. So I'm going to go to another question from our audience. And if you want to uh, join in this, please go to the Q&A function and submit your question. This is from Faraji Bartz, and uh, he asks, well, how did you gather your research? What specific methods did you implement to get your data? And did you use a data set? And if so, how large was it? That's a very modern uh, uh, journalistic question. Uh, but how, how did you get, gather your research? Um, it's a funny story. I, I... I originally wrote the basic story after I went out to Rondelap in 1975 and 76 uh, for the New Yorker. And uh, it ran 60,000 words. It was too long. It was not printed. I had the galleys found by my wife uh, from the New Yorker. And I was asked to write a memoir. Or but before I do it, would I expand the earlier galleys into a 100 or 200 page book? It turns out during the Clinton administration, the Department of Energy released 100,000 documents going back to the crossroads, really going back to the Manhattan Project. And uh, I went through all uh, online. I mean, I, I have no <laughs> exotic uh, computer skills. Google is a great thing and you learn how to follow things and you, you would be actually amazed what you can find on the web uh, if you learn how to look for it. Uh, I've, not to boost Google in a funny way, because I used to find documents one day by using this five code words or three code words, use the same three the next day, and the document wouldn't be there. But it, um, if you have time and, and kind of a craziness for research, uh, there is nothing like a computer. Walter's uh, column, if, if you're interested in some of the things Walter digs up, uh, is available uh, at a website called the Cipher Brief, C-I-P-H-E-R, and it's called Fine Print. Uh, it's, it's got lots of scoops. So Walter, here's a question from our mutual friend, uh, Terrence Smith, uh, formerly of the New York Times. And Terry asks, how much of this information was made public at the time, even elliptically? That's one thing I found myself wondering. Uh, that's an important question. The answer is almost none of it. Most material on nuclear weapons um, was, was classified. 
and after it was released 10, 20 years later, uh, it's a real eye opener. Uh, one of my problems in writing history and in reading other people's history is that um, when you tend to find out everything that went on in the past, you tend to think everybody should have known it or did know it at the time. And, and that's untrue. And so I tried in this to, at least on some occasions, point out how little the public knew of what was going on as against what was really going on. Um, and that's important for people to understand. It's very easy to think, why didn't people do X or Y when you learn 10 years later um, what was kept from you? There's a fascinating and moving question from uh, Michael Burke. And he writes, I'm eager to read your book. My dad, who passed away at 91 last year, was a private in the army on Enuik Tuk Atoll in 1952 during Operation Ivy. For years, he told the story of GIs on ships at sea, feeling first the intense blast of heat, then hearing the explosion. GIs were supposed to measure radioactivity, but all of the targets had been vaporized. My question, Michael Burke asks, is how big of a threat do you think it is that terrorists might gain control of a nuclear weapon? Um, I, I think people talk about it, but a nuclear weapon itself has thousands of parts that are tightly machined. And the nuclear material itself has to be guarded because the people who have it are exposed themselves. So that uh, it may sound like you can get hold of one, um, but it'd be very difficult. And if you got hold of one, uh, to make it explode nuclear would be another trick. A much more dangerous thing is what the Manhattan Project people thought about earlier, which is what's known as a dirty bomb, to get some radioactive material and just blow it up and spread it around on the ground. Uh, but Oppenheimer and the scientists, uh, believe it or not, didn't think you'd kill enough people. That's, that's chilling. Um, and Walter, on this question of, of whether um, terrorists are, are seeking these weapons, certainly that was one of the things that was driving Cheney, uh, all the people in the Bush White House after 9-11 was this fear that we'd ha have a dirty bomb in the New York subways. Uh, how likely do you think those scenarios are? I mean, certainly people who hate America, and there are a lot of them, have read the same information about how destructive these weapons are. Do you think they want to acquire them and use them, or is that just a kind of scare fantasy? Um, I hate to say it, but my, I've thought about it a fair amount, and my kind of glib answer is you can get poisons at your local chemist and put them in the water system, which is a much safer way to terrorize a city, I hate to say it, uh, than it is trying to get a bomb. So if you have somebody of that mind, that would be a much easier way to, to do it. And, and there's something about the idea of somebody, a terrorist getting a weapon, to me, it's, it's very much reminds me of uh, what we used to talk about, the Russians, and now we talk about the Chinese and the North Koreans. They're crazy, they would do it. 
um, people uh, aren't that crazy. I mean, there, there are plenty of crazy people, but you can uh, do a lot of harm with a gun as we see. So I just want to remind uh, our viewers, if you want to see this uh, extraordinary reporting, um, a way to buy the book is just to go to the chat function and click on the a little link there, uh, and it will take you to politics and prose. So we have a, a question from Wesley Brown, which is not on the subject of, of the Marshall Islands, but it's pretty darn interesting. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about it because uh, you follow everything in the national security space. Wesley Brown asks, what do you think about the recent choice to establish a space force? Seems like it opens Pandora's box wider to weaponizing space, including nuclear weapons. Your thoughts? Uh, two things. I think space is a problem. Uh, militarily, there is a treaty uh, called the Outer Space Treaty uh, that bars nuclear weapons in space, or even the stationing of nuclear weapons in outer space. Uh, how good it is, how useful it will be as we move into space. Uh, but again, they don't make it more useful if you put it in space uh, than they are in the ground. The, uh, it reminds me of the story about uh, the, the newest Chinese threat of hypersonic weapon. Uh, the Russians actually built one back in, in the 1970s, 16 of them. Uh, we looked at building them and decided an ICBM is better. Uh, the argument is you, if, if the Chinese build these, we have no defense against them. I remind people, we have no defense against ICBM from Russia in any kind of number. We have, we say we have a defense against the North Koreans if they launch a few, but we have no defense against ICBM. So why build another not defensive one? Here's a, a question again from an anonymous uh... Uh, person watching uh, who asks if you don't favor complete uh, nuclear uh, non-proliferation, uh, you know, zero nuclear weapons, as, as you were saying earlier, Walter, what amount would you suggest each country uh, reduce its, its nuclear weapons down to? And is, is there a practical way to move toward that kind of goal? Um. The last part of it is easier to answer. You have to have parties willing to reduce. Uh, it's clear to have, we have 1,500 warheads allowed, deployed. Um, we probably don't need two thirds of them even that. Uh, but then you have to worry, then uh, they'll argue you have to have defense, you can't have defensive. We're vulnerable to nuclear weapons, but we certainly don't need anywhere near the numbers we have. So, Walter, we've come to the uh, end of our allotted hour. Um, and I just want to, again, urge people to, to buy the book. There's a way that your colleagues and, and longtime readers like me know this is a, a culmination of work you've been doing your whole career. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, read and it, just an illustration of, of why you're so uh, deeply respected in our business. So I want to thank Walter Pincus for uh, talking about his book tonight. And uh, Walter, if there's any 
final thought you have. Uh, otherwise, we'll turn it back to politics and prose. Well, I think uh, I appreciate the time and uh, I really do hope people read the book because it, it, it combines all the things I care about, which is the human side of the threat of nuclear weapons, as well as the weapons themselves. So politics and prose, take it away. All right. Well, Walter, thank you so very much for uh, discussing this. And David, you did a, just a marvelous job as, as always navigating and moderating this conversation. So thank you both so very much. Um, and as David has said a couple of times, I did put the link to purchase uh, Blown to Hell in the chat. Um, just click on that link. It'll take you straight to the Politics and Prose website. Um, and that way you're, you're helping Walter out. You're helping keep Politics and Prose around. Um, so thank you for doing that. Uh, thank both Walter and David so much for that. Um, oh, I also did put a link to the Cypher, uh, Cypher brief in the chat as well. So you can click on that and read all of Walter's amazing articles and he's going to keep pumping those out. We were talking about that. He's, he's partway through his next one. So click on that link and see what he's working on right now. Um, so from everyone here at PMP, we want to thank you for being here, joining this wonderful conversation. It's very intriguing. Um, and join us again um, right here on PMP Live. Until then, Stay well read, y'all.